Hello, and welcome to another episode of Whiskey Society. I'm your host, Josh Chud. Tonight, our guest is the always charming Scott Ellis. Scott is the West Coast brand ambassador for the Compass Box Whiskey Company, and his whiskey knowledge is as extensive and accurate as his beard would lead you to believe. We have shared countless delicious whiskeys together, and tonight we'll be discussing how Compass Box continues to impress and inspire consumers around the world. I would like to thank you for tuning in this evening. I hope you were able to find a bottle of Compass Box, and I would love to hear what you're drinking in the comments section below. Let's meet our guests. Scott, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Josh. Thank you uh, ever so much for having me on this evening, and, and thanks to everyone for tuning in, and, uh, and uh, happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Where are you joining us from? I'm, I'm at my house. I live up in Sonoma in California and it's this beautiful little town of Sonoma. It's uh it's not the worst place in the world to be quarantined now, I've got to be honest with you. Could be a lot worse. Glad yeah. I moved out of my one bedroom apartment. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, how are you staying busy these days? It's it, it it's unusual, but you've you I mean thanks I have two small children. I have a, a two month old and a, and a two year old, and so there's, there's routine in our life because we have to maintain that routine. Just otherwise, it would just all go to hell really really quickly. So I'm up at seven o'clock every morning because my two year old wakes up at seven o'clock every morning. And yeah, you 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 try to do. There obviously isn't as much work as there was. I used to travel, you know, extensively. I'm home now, so it's pretty. Work um, and just like calling people and, and just trying to stay in touch with people and stuff like that. So, positive, to be honest with you, you know, and, and it, it keeps you off the source of the too if you work. So, uh, it's, it's definitely different than it was before, but there's still plenty of Compass Box fans out there. There's still plenty of whiskey that's out there. still plenty of people that sell Compass Box whiskey. And so, you know, my job is basically just to, just to keep the whole thing going. You know, if there's any issues that pop up, just just handle them. And just our mantra comes is is, our mantra is is to make the the, the world of whiskey in place, and, and that's basically what kind of keeps me going on a day-to-day -day basis. That's awesome, um, Scott. What was the first uh, distillery you ever visited? The first distillery I ever visited was actually the Anchor Distillery in San Francisco, uh, and that was probably in twenty ten. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just a tiny tin pot distillery back then. It was literally like a, a, a still that was smaller than your refrigerator, tucked away in the corner of this room. They told me a wonderful story about when they started distilling back in like the early 90s. 
uh, Fritz Maytag, the one danger at the time, he basically looked around at all the guys, all the brewers that he had working for him making beer, and he was like, well, guys, we're going to start making spirits. Who wants to be my distiller? And one of the guys that literally just put his hand up was like, well, I'll give you a shot. And as, as far as I know, he's still a master distiller there right now. So, uh, but yeah, Angel was actually the first distillery I ever went to. Um, and then Four Roses in Kentucky. And I've been to, I think, I was, I was kind of, I think I've been to either seven or nine distilleries in Scotland. You know, when you, every time you use a distillery, it's a little bit of a fuzzy memory. You know? yeah. Yes, indeed. I, I, I'm sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have glimpses and photographs to tell the stories, you know? Right, exactly. We didn't have these icons almost nowadays, like how much of our lives would actually really happen. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. Um, so how did you get to start in the industry? What was your uh, first job? So my first job in the industry was in um, 1997 when I started. Basically, I, I graduated college and, and I wanted to work in, in a stock market, so I wanted to be you know, a trader, or a stockbroker, all that kind of stuff. And I had a degree in it and I really enjoyed studying it. And I did it for two weeks and I hated it. Uh, I'm just not an office person. Um, and I'm not a big fan of commutes at 7 o'clock in the morning either. So I basically quit and, and I, I saw an advert in uh, my university newspaper for a, a bar manager position, a chain of bars in London, and I applied for it and I got it. Um, it was a chain of bars called Fisher and Piano. Um, they're still in London, um, but they had about seven or eight bars around London back in the day. Um, and, uh, yeah, and and so in January 1997, I remember walking into the, the bar it was, uh, on Dean Street in Soho. And it's not there anymore. Um, but there's, there's another bar in this place, but yeah, it was, uh, I remember walking in on a Monday morning, walking in being like, yeah, it just feels right. And so that was, what, 23 plus years ago now, and since then, I've worked in bars and restaurants, and and, 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 and I worked for a distributor, and then four years ago, I literally I got my dream job, I got hired by my favorite, whiskey, my favorite spirit brand in the world, which is pretty incredible when you think about it, so. Yes. It was a long, so it was route, I, I, you know. I can, uh, yeah, the road less travel for sure. That's awesome. Well, I mean, at least you ended up at Compass Box. It's a fantastic company to work for. I, I, I couldn't. I mean, honest, honest, hand on heart, I, I, I couldn't be luckier. I mean, I, I've worked for this company for over four years now, and it's still my favorite spirit company. I mean, it's, it's. I know mean, you have a lot of the brand that come on and everything, and you know when you do this job, you, you live it, you breathe it, um, all day, twenty four seven, and you know. For Plus, later, I'm still in the place I still love what we do. I'm still really proud of present these, these whiskeys. And I still personally enjoy drinking them as well, which makes the whole job a whole lot easier. I sure do hope so. Right? <laughs> well, I am starting us off with a little bit of hedonism, which is a blended grain whiskey. From Compass Box, I hope everybody out there has a glass of whiskey in their hand and is enjoying it as well. Scott, what are you drinking right now? Um, I'm drinking. This is um, the story of the Spaniard. This is uh, the most uh, recent addition to our regular lineup. Um, it's been out for over a year and a half now. Uh, but yeah, this is um, just a really delicious, sumptuous, round, lots of red fruits. It's really, really easy drinking. Where you sit down with friends and you don't even realize half a bottle later that you've only got half left. It goes down yeah. to easy. So, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm sipping on today. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> it does. Frequently, too. So, oh, one of my all time favorites is this hedonism, which is a blended grain whiskey. Um, blended grain whiskey means they're basically using grain whiskeys from multiple distilleries in Scotland and blending those together to create a unique f flavor profile. This is released once a year, I believe, and every time it comes out, I'm always stoked to grab a bottle. You should look for it as well. Later on tonight, we'll be trying some double single. And then moving on to one of our personal selections of the Great King Street. Well, Scott, let's talk whiskey. Let's. Tell us about the origins of Compass Box and how everything kind of got started. 
Yeah, so it, it, it's it's a really unique story. It, it all starts off with um, um, an American um, by the name of John Glazer. Um, John is from Minnesota originally, uh, went to school, um, University of uh, Miami, Ohio. Um, and John wanted to be a winemaker coming out of a uh, university. Um, and, and, and a smart man told him, he said, John, you don't want to be a winemaker and just move to Napa and get in line and be a winemaker. You, you're, you're better off on the business side of things. So John worked in a wine store and, and eventually got, um, in the mid nineties, got hired by this, this, um, this company that called Diageo that makes these spirit brands, including this one called Johnny Walker. I think most people might've heard of. And for five years, uh, John, John worked as a, as a marketing executive on Johnny Walker Blue. And, uh, during this time he, um, he moved over to London. Um, but he fell in love with scotch um, while he, with his time working for, for Johnny Walker for Diageo. Just absolutely fell in love with scotch. Um, was lucky enough to be able to pick the brains of, of the, uh, the, you know, the, the main blenders at Johnny Walker. And basically, in, in John's spare time, he became like an amateur blender at home. He had access to all these, this, this, these distilleries. I mean, Diageo, they literally own about one third of distilleries in Scotland. So 30 plus distilleries. So he had you know, access to all these whiskeys and he started messing around at home with them. But with just a different mentality than to um, how they are, you know, most blends in Scotch whiskey are put together, you know. And, and essentially, John came at this with a, with a winemaking mentality rather than a traditional Scotch blending mentality. Um, and um, so, so, John, you know, he kind of became an amateur blender. And then after a few years, he went to Diageo and, and, and pitched him the idea about starting a, um, a craft blending division inside Diageo. And, and, and one of the higher ups at Diageo, who John spoke to, said, John, it's actually really, really, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic idea, but it's not right for us, but we think you should pursue it on your own. So John, he, he quit that job and started Compass Box literally off his kitchen table in London back in 2000. And Hedonism was the very, very first whiskey that we produced. And it was the, the first whiskey of its kind. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned it's a blended grain whiskey. So I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if most people watching this are familiar with the different categories of Scotch whiskey. Scotch whiskey is, is quite a, um, a user unfriendly um, spirit to get into. I mean, bourbon, you know, all right, it's mostly made from corn, get it, rye, mostly made from rye. What's the most been blended Scotch and, and single malt Scotch? I don't understand that. And, and so, so just to, 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 to put it all back for just a second, there are two types of whiskey made in Scotland. There's malt whiskey, which is made from 100% malted barley, in pot stills. And then there's grain whiskey is the second type of whiskey that most people probably aren't familiar with. Um, grain whiskey literally means not made from 100% malted barley, but almost more importantly, it's, it's produced in, in a column still or a patent still or a continuous still um, or a coffee still, all kind of different variations on the same thing. Um, and, and grain whiskey, um, it was invented in about the 1830s. Um, it's a lighter spirit than, than malt whiskey. Um, but it is, it's, it's the redheaded stepchild of Scotch whiskey. No one talks about it. No one likes to really talk about it. Uh, I'm sure everyone's, so the blended Scotch category, which is the, the big corporate brands, your, you know, Johnny Walker Doers, Haig, um, um, J&B, Shivers. Um, yeah, I'm forgetting many, but these are all blended Scotches. And the definition of a blended Scotch is grain whiskey and malt whiskey from different distilleries blended together. That's a blended scotch. Blended scotch still makes up 90% of all, or 89% of all scotch whiskey sold today. It's still blended scotch, believe it or not. The other category most people are going to be aware of is, is what's a single malt. And single malt literally means it's malt whiskey produced at a single distillery. That's the definition of, of, of single malt whiskey. So, but there are three different um, other categories of scotch whiskey as well. Um, so if you have single malt, there's also blended malts, which basically means it's 100% malt whiskey, but the malt whiskeys are produced at more than one distillery. So it may be two distilleries, it may be 50 distilleries, but it's, it's classified as, as, as a blended malt. Then moving over to the other side, there's you got single malts, then, then there's single grain whiskey, which means grain whiskey made at a single distillery, of which there are only a handful, never really been heavily produced or marketed. Um, they were traditionally, they were pretty much only sold in Scotland around the distillery where they were produced. And there's only about a handful of distilleries in Scotland that produce grain whiskey, um, um, to this day. Um, and they're just basically big alcohol factories. They're not romantic like the, the malt distilleries are. They're just big factories and they, they don't just pump out grain whiskey. They pump out gin and vodka and rubbing alcohol and, and pretty much anything 
um, alcohol related. Um, so, so that's grain whiskey, that's single grain whiskey. A blended grain whiskey, up until 2000, there was no such thing as a blended grain whiskey. And, uh, but it took this American who just kind of thought a little bit out of the box um, to be like, I want to make a stamp with my first whiskey when I release it. And so hedonism, what you're nipping on right now, is the world's very first blended grain whiskey. It's a whiskey that we're incredibly proud of at Compass Box. Um, it, it's very expensive for us to make it because we use quite old whiskeys in there. Um, uh, the, the grain whiskeys that we use in hedonism are much, much older than the grain whiskeys you'll find in blended scotches out there. Um, but and, it, and to this day, literally 20 years later, it really is a category of one. And there's only, uh, as far as you know, to our, aware, our awareness, we're the only, com the only company that actually produces a blended grain scotch whiskey on a regular basis. So it, the, the hedonism that we're talking about, this is the blended grain category right here. Um, but it's the whole idea behind Compass Box was to do something different, so it was to explore and innovate and, and essentially try and come up with some unique flavor profiles that no one had made before. Um, there's a lot of people in Scotland who will, you know, if they're blending or, or, or you know, whatever they're doing, there's the, they're following a formula, they're following in the footsteps of maybe, you know, that maybe their father, you know, had the head distiller role, master distiller role of distillery or, make, or and you know, but in, in the, the 70s and 80s and, and 90s and early 2000s, there wasn't a lot of innovation. There was nothing really new or different in Scotch whiskey. And it was kind of getting left behind a little bit in the world of whiskey. And, and John saw this when he started Compass Box. And, and I say he wanted to he wanted to do things differently. So literally designed a, a, a whiskey company from, from the ground floor up, how we wanted one to look. And, and yeah, and the very first whiskey we ever produced when Compass Box really was just a one-man band. It was John Glazer literally walking around London with bottles of hedonism in his backpack walking from bar to bar and selling them. Um, and, and, and that's how it all started, really, with the world's first blended grain scotch whiskey. Uh, so, yeah, hedonism is the very, very first whiskey we ever produced. And uh, we, still, we still produce it today, and, and it's absolutely delicious. It's, um, I suppose the best way to describe hedonism would be like, it, it, it's bourbon for scotch whiskey drinkers. Um, or, or, or scotch for bourbon drinkers, whichever way you want to look at it. it it's got lovely... Um, caramel vanilla kind of notes it's it's grain whiskey as i mentioned is always a lighter spirit than, than a malt whiskey due to the, the way it's produced um it's a lighter body it's normally got um lighter flavors and then this this particular whiskey is is a blend of grain whiskeys that have been all in asian ex bourbon barrels so it's still picking up a lot of those same flavor flavor profiles that bourbon picks up from those american oak barrels as well so it really is a, a very unique flavor profile, which is the whole idea behind Compass Box and what we do. Um, and, and it's, yeah, as I say, it's something we're still very incredibly proud of 20 years later. It is absolutely delicious. <laughs> it is. I, I mean, I tell people, if you don't like hedonism, you just don't like whiskey. Just stick to vodka or tequila, whatever else you drink, because it's, it's, it's one of those category... It, 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 you can't really define hedonism. It just kind of you know lives in this little world of its own and everything. But it, it's yeah. If you don't like hedonism, then then we'll we'll have a different conversation. Well, tune in our other, our other live show, Vodka Live, yeah. where we try all vodkas from around the world. Um, <laughs> and try, to, try to spot the differences. So you mentioned that Compass Box is a blending blending whiskey house, which is different than a distillery. Could you, yeah. could you quickly explain the difference there? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, we refer to ourselves as a boutique Scotch whiskey blending house. We're not distillers. We do not own a distillery. Um, I doubt John would even know how to operate a still if he had one. Um, so what we do is, is we buy aged parcels of whiskey from certain distilleries around Scotland. Um, and we basically, we, we blend them. We create our own recipe. Um, and, and we'll blend them. We, we generally use um, a lot less components that are in most Scotch whiskey blends. Um, in, in pretty much all of these whiskeys, there's probably between three to six different components, whereas in most of the, the, the big um, blended Scotch brands out there, there's 30-plus different whiskeys in, in, in those bottles. So, um, so uh, yeah, I say, you know, we, we come in with a, a very different mindset than, than the traditional Scotch whiskey um companies, whether they're blends, whether they're single malts. And, and also remember, single malts are still blends. It's Single malts are generally blends of malt whiskey from a single distillery. So, uh, so you know, just that, that whole single blended, the, the misnomer from 
the word blend from single really is 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 something we should you know kind of think about when we're talking about things in the industry. But yeah, that, that's what we are. We're basically like a little workshop. We have an office in in West London, um, where which is probably about the size of of bar three piece. Um, and and the back portion of the room is is our blending lab. There's there's a long table and there's, and there's barrel samples and there's test tubes and vials. And John and his whiskey making team they will they will sample all kinds of whiskies and 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 we'll pick out the ones that we find are really intriguing, and they'll basically play around in the world's coolest science lab, and 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 make them in like hundred ml vials and 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 just keep tweaking them until they you know think they've really got like you know they, they produce something that's really compelling and intriguing and, and different from anything else that's out there, and if we find it delicious and and I say brings us back to the glass a second time, then we'll probably go ahead and release it. If we don't love it, then we'll just cancel that and we'll, and we'll start all over again, do something new. So, uh, but yeah, we are a blending house. We don't own a, a distillery. We are reliant on other distilleries to provide us with delicious whiskey, but then we just blend those different those delicious whiskeys together with just our own little compass box way. And then, uh, and then, uh, what's very very important about what we do, which which is kind of unique in the industry, is we always age our blends. And and most most companies that make blends, whether it's a blended scotch, a blended malt, or even a single malt, because I say a single malt is still a blend of whiskies from a, generally a blend of whiskies from a single distillery. It's not just a single barrel of whiskey from that distillery. But then most of the time, after the blendings are curled, they'll, they'll send the blend straight to the bubbling line. We have this belief, which I'm pretty sure comes from John's wine roots, that if, if you're blending um, separate flavor profiles together, those flavor profiles, they need, they need time to get to know each other. And it and and so every time every whiskey that we make, we always age our blends. We we let's like say we marry them. Um, sometimes it's just a month or two. Sometimes I think the longest we've done is like four and a half years. But we always put our blends back into a barrel and we let them sit there and hang out and get to know each other. And the analogy I like to use is like cooking chili. I mean, chili is always better like a week after you've made it than when you take it right off the pot. You know all those all those different you know ingredients that you put in there in, in chili. It becomes one. You got one complex chili flavor rather than like five or six different flavors kind of fighting for your attention. That's that, that's kind of the same way with blending whiskey. You know, it'd be the same way you would blend in wine, or if you were doing any kind of blending. If you were cooking, you know, sometimes food tastes better a week after you cook it than when you make it. So, so yeah, it's it's expensive, it's time consuming, but it makes a better whiskey, and and that's what we're in this for. We we do this to make the, the best whiskey we possibly can. Sorry. So basically, Cubby's Box is innovating their whiskeys every time they put it in a bottle. They're taking casks from all around Scotland, deciding which flavors will go with each other and work together. And sometimes they don't work together, toss those out. But a great time to move on to one of my all time favorite whiskeys, which is Cubby's Box's double single, which is. Quite possibly one of the most amazing whiskeys I've ever tried. This is how Compass Box maintains its position at the top of my list. Anytime a guest asks for a whiskey they've never tried before, I usually go to Compass Box. Delicious. Scott, what are you drinking? What's your second? Um, well, I mean, I do have quite a selection behind me. and and um, But yeah, double single, what you're, you're drinking right there, that was a whiskey we released in the spring of 2017. Um, I believe that's the third time we've done a double single, and double single is is a single malt blended with a single grain. One single malt, one single grain. That's it. That's where the double single comes Ooh. from. Technically, it's a blended Scotch. This fits in the same category as you know, Johnny's and Doers and stuff like that. But it's just two component whiskies rather than say thirty odd different component whiskies. And, and double single that's just spectacular. What well, I've been nipping on recently. Um, we just released the Rogues Banquet right here. This mm. is our most recent limited edition. It's only been out pretty much since um, since April, so we've been out for just over a month right now. Uh, this is an absolutely fantastic blend. Um, it's it's again a it's not too dissimilar to to the double single. It's a, it's a blended Scotch. It's got grain whiskey and malt whiskey, three different malt whiskeys and one different grain whiskey in it. Uh, Rogues Banquet. Um, that's fantastic. Um, I've been really, really honest. It was it was 92 degrees today up here in Sonoma, so it was hot, really hot. This is um, the Circle that we released last summer. 
Um, it's to do with a, a global bartender competition that we've been running for the past couple of years. And this was a whiskey that was designed by the winner of that competition, Rosie, who's from a, a wonderful bar in London called Three Sheets. And it was a whiskey that was designed to be um, enjoyed in the park with friends on a nice sunny day. So uh, I will be sipping on some of this later on this evening. Oh, uh, I like it. So I know you have a huge repertoire of stories to choose from. I was wondering if you'd be able to share the story of Spice Tree with us tonight. Yeah, so Spice Tree. Spice Tree is is, is one of our core whiskeys, uh, part of our core range. Spice Tree, this is a whiskey that when we originally released it in 2005, it, it was outlawed by the Scotch Whiskey Association. Um, again, it goes back to John's, uh, John's wine roots. Um, John wanted to incorporate the flavor of French oak in, into Scotch whiskey, something that no one had done before. Um, about the, the vast majority of Scotch is Asian used bourbon barrels. Uh, I, I think I read it's about 92% of Scotch whiskey is Asian used bourbon barrels, and, and the vast majority of, of that remaining 8% is used in sherry butts, um, barrels that have been used to hold sherry. But but John wanted to he wanted to incorporate the you know the flavor of, of French oak, which gives it a very different flavor than um, than American oak. French oak will give you these lovely baking spices, cinnamon, clove, ginger, maybe a little tarragon, so forth like that, versus the the buttery, creamy, vanilla kind of American oak flavors. So yeah, two thousand and five um, spice the original spice tree. It was a blend of of a handful of malt whiskies from the Highlands that that John had aged in a barrel with new French oak inner staves. And then released it, and and uh, we won some awards for it, and it was very very popular. And then we got a cease and desist letter from the Scotch Whiskey Association because you're not allowed to use inner staves in Scotch whiskey. In America, you know, the the rules are a lot looser over here in the US than they are in Scotland. Um, but yeah, that, so so um, so we had to pull that whiskey off the market, and and our, we figured out a little workaround. Basically, now what we do is we take a we take a, a ex bourbon barrel, American oak barrel but we put new French oak on the heads of the barrels. So we make this blend of, of Highland malt whiskies, and then we age that blend for about two years in, in, these, in these bourbon barrels with new French oak heads on them. And that's where, that's where we get the lovely spice flavor from that, that, that comes from in Spice Tree. Nice. So, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic whiskey. It really is. It, it's, if hedonism was a uh, Scotch whiskey for bourbon drinkers, then Spice Tree would be a Scotch whiskey for rye drinkers. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Two of my favorite compass boxes. Um, another compass box that has always fascinated me, and every time I suggest it to a uh, guest who loves peated whiskeys, they are always impressed. Um, and that's Peat Monster. And you've been producing Peat Monster for over 10 years now. How has that process changed if you're sourcing whiskeys from multiple distilleries and blending those together? You have to be kind of innovative to keep a consistent flavor profile is that a yeah, so, so we have um supply agreements with with the distilleries that we use in our, in our core ranges so that we can we can keep the recipes similar um from time to time uh, as, as i say we're reliant on, on them to supply us with the whiskey um that we use but sometimes we have to adapt and change maybe a distillery changes ownership maybe they have to shut down the distillery for cleaning or changing the stills maybe the people at the distillery, they've decided they want to change the flavor profile of that whiskey and we feel it doesn't fit what we're looking for anymore. So so our recipes do, they do evolve over time. Um, sometimes it's just minor tweaks that, that aren't really noticeable. Maybe we just start looking for, you know, whiskey from a different distillery that has the same flavor profile as, as what we've used before. But Pete Monster took on, an, on a pretty big facelift um, in last year, about a year ago. Um, the, the previous Peat Monster, which had a, a, a brown label with a gold monster on it, we'd been making that whiskey since 2000. Again, with the Peat Monster was released in 2005. And we just kind of felt like the flavor profile was getting a little bit tired. Um, the, the heavily peated whiskeys, they're quite a new thing to Scotch whiskey. I mean, 2005, when we released Peat Monster, it was, it was a very heavy, heavily peated whiskey. It was, it was definitely at the higher end of the spectrum. And since then, you've, you've seen the likes of Optimor and Ardbeg coming out and doing all their things. And, and I mean, the peat drinker nowadays is drinking much more heavily peated whiskeys than they were 15 years ago. And, and so we really just kind of to update it. A time frame right now. 2005, I was 20 years old and drinking green apple twist vodka. So <laughs> I was not even close to drinking peated whiskeys. So, yes, it's quite a bit. 
<laughs> yeah, I was drinking a lot of Jägermeister and working in a sports bar in 2005. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so we've been working on just kind of like refreshing the flavor profile of Pete Monster uh, for a while. Uh, and we, we launched it um, in, in, I think it was April or May of last year, we, we launched a new Pete Monster. So you'll see the label is a lot different now. This is um, a label that we'd originally used for, for a, a, a limited edition of Pete Monster. We came out with in 2015 called Pete Monster 10th Anniversary. And we always loved the label, and we thought like doing making the new blend was a great time to bring this new label out. So, so this whiskey right here is is about two thirds Kalila, one third Lafroig. Uh, the previous version of, of Pete Master also had some Lechig and some Ardmore in it as well. Uh, but this is a lot more fruit driven, a lot more creamy than the previous uh, Pete Master. The previous version was a little bit more earthy. Um, and I, I mean, I'm a not just because I drink the Kool Aid for the company, but I think this is I think. The up uh, the uh, the refresh was absolutely worthwhile. It's this is a really really fun whiskey to drink. I it's agree. an approachable peated whiskey. You don't hear I, that very often. I agree. <laughs> well, I am loving this whiskey. Scott, could you run us through the newest whiskey you just told us about earlier called Rogue's Banquet? I have yeah. a little sample that Santa Claus sent me in the mail right here. Man, you must have been a good boy this year. I was. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Rogue's Banquet. So, so, so this is the twentieth year. This is our twentieth anniversary uh, as a company. So we were founded in 2000, 2020, uh, Do the math, and and we were we were planning on having a bunch of celebrations this year, um, and planning on, and we had some really great marketing plans in the works. Unfortunately, they've all gone a little askew right now with with what we're living through. So, but yeah, Rogue's Banquet, it was designed as a celebration. This was going to be the first whiskey of our 20th anniversary. It was it was meant to be a whiskey that's just sumptuous and the type of whiskey you would want to drink if you were having like a big feast with friends. Uh, that's that, that's kind of, the, you know, the flavor profile uh, or, or the idea, the concept behind the whiskey. And um, it, it is a, uh, it's about 70% of, of uh, Glen Elkin. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Milton Duff. Um, the recipe is on the back. I don't have my glasses, but um, yeah, about seventy percent of it is, is a melted duff whiskey. There's a little bit of Klein Leash in there as well, um, uh, a little bit of Glen Elgin, and then some grain whiskey from a distillery called North British. And so, yeah, the the label. I don't know how much you can see right here, but the label is there are there are nods to twelve different compass box labels from the past, all in this label. If you think that there's a lot going on in the label, that's why it's so busy. There are, if you will, you, you will see the P monster down there at the bottom, but there are 11 other uh, label uh, components that are in this as well. And so, yeah, Rogue's Banquet, it was intended as being the 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 launch of our 20th anniversary, which uh, we, 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 we will still celebrate. We're just going to celebrate in a different manner than we were planning beforehand. So, but yeah, Rogue's Banquet, um, I say, released recently. Should retail in California for somewhere between uh, 150 to 175, depending on where you shop. Um, it is a limited edition release, but I know there are still plenty of bottles out there on shelves. But our limited editions, they are what well, they are. Once they're gone, they're gone. They're um, um, we don't have supply agreements with with these distilleries to put, you know to supply us with these whiskeys. Um, the limited editions, it may be we were lucky enough to get you know a sometimes it's you know 25 barrels of a particular whiskey from a distillery that we won't be able to get again sometimes it might be one barrel you know but they are and then we just we just go to work with them but yeah we even if we wanted to we couldn't make these whiskeys again so if you if you like them if you love them get your hands on them now because once they're gone that's it um yeah. like you said we are in a different time uh, that is unprecedented. And I know Compass Box has been pretty active in trying to support um, people in my industry, which is getting people drunk, bars. Um, you guys have been reaching out, trying to help out with people. Can you explain a little bit about the charity you guys have going on? And how yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, we, we are a small independent company. We don't have the resources of a lot of the major brands that are out there. Um, I think we're up right now we're maybe up to 19 full-time employees across the, the the UK and the US for Compass Box. There's only four of us here in the US. Um, so, yeah, we are a, definitely a small independent company. So we didn't have the, the financial resources to just donate a whole bunch of money to, to uh, you know, to bartender relief efforts and so forth. So we started a fundraising effort. We designed, um, we got together with some folks at a wonderful website called Bonfire. 
Um, and we designed um, T-shirts and sweatshirts and also some tote bags with, with this really, really cool slogan on it, kindness, community, and, and creativity. And all proceeds from these, um, these limited editions, I think, yeah, T-shirts, sweatshirts, and totes. Um, and yeah, all proceeds we make are going to some, uh, a couple of different of charities that support um, hospitality workers, bartenders, waiters, hotel workers, and so forth that are out of work right now. Um, and if anyone is interested in ordering one of these products, funny enough, I have this link right here. For, um, I don't, Josh, I just emailed this to you if you want to email this out to everybody afterwards. But yeah, if you go to bonfire.com and, and find the compass box um, page that's on there, and, and you can go ahead and, and order one of these. I say, even the t shirts and sweatshirts are limited editions. So, uh, but yeah, as I say, the. The bar and restaurant trade is basically where we got started at Compass Box. These are, you know, a lot of the people that have supported us uh, from the get-go. Um, me personally, I uh, I started out in the business. I was pretty much spent all my life in, you know, working in bars and restaurants until I got into this side of the business. So uh, we feel, you know, very very sad about what's happened. We we want to help out as best we can. So so please go ahead, buy your t-shirts, buy your sweatshirts, and. Uh, and let's raise as much money as we can for, for those people that basically got us drunk all, all these years. True. So um, if you have any questions out there, guests or interested in the charity, uh, please reach out and we will answer any questions you have. If you have questions for Scott or myself, send them on in. Um, I see here it says from Alex Rios, Scott, do you have the general? And that smile. Oh, yeah. This is my this is my San Diego tuxedo right here. Yeah. I do have a bottle of the general. Yes, yes. I actually um, I managed. To, I, I found a bottle in the store up here in Sonoma about right after I started working for the company about four years ago, and I, I got the buyer to give me a really good price on it. And the first thing I did when I came home was I cracked it and I poured a shot for my wife. Um, cause I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that, uh, whiskey's for drinking and sharing with friends. There's a lot of collecting going on right now. And, and this whiskey in particular is, is the most collectible whiskey we've ever produced. This whiskey, I think we produced just over 1500 bottles of this whiskey. I think it was 2014. It came out and original retail price would have been about $300. Um, now it's going to cost you best part of a thousand dollars to buy this on, on the secondary market. So, but it's very, very old whiskey. It, it's a it's a, a blend of, of a couple of barrels of whiskey of, of blended I, I believe one was a blended scotch and one was a blended malt and both were were over 30 years old uh, we don't even know what was in the blends so but yeah this is this is super super rare whiskey so but yes yes I do have a bottle it is and if you come over I'll be happy to share with you as well oh that's an invite to everybody that watches this video so <laughs> I'll have Scott's address in the comments. <laughs> Show up, knock on his door. Um, we have a question from Lauren who says, Josh, on a scale from one to 10, how drunk are you? And I would say I'm probably at a four right now, but in 20 minutes, I'll be at a six. <laughs> but the night is still early. There is a link for the charity in the description. Uh, feel free to click on the link, grab one of those shirts, help out bartenders and service people that definitely need your help right now, considering that we are not allowed to perform our amazing duties. And any other questions? So, the question we have is hedonism is obviously successful. And yes, I am slurring my words. Um, why is it not well, more well known? Grain, blended grain whiskeys. Well, to, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I would imagine there's probably a couple of factors in there. No, number one, there isn't a lot of very old grain whiskey out there. Grain whiskey is generally produced to be used at a fairly young age in blended scotches, which most blended scotches are, let's be kind here and say they're less than delicious. 
Um, um, that's that's kind of um, so there isn't a lot of old, interesting blended uh, or grain whiskey out there to play with in the first place. Um, but secondly, it's it's such a non-traditional flavor profile that I think a, a lot of producers that you know scotch is is, is very tradition and heritage based industry and, and so uh, a lot of producers out there they, they they follow down that path and maybe they're they're not you know looking to get quite as as much outside of the mainstream as we are at compass box uh, so a combination of factors for sure definitely um but yeah it, it's as i say like green whiskey is definitely considered you know that possibly but some people might you know I think it's an inferior type of whiskey to malt whiskey in 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 Scotland. That's um, that that's up to you know everyone's opinion to decide. But yeah, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. There's no particular one particular answer. It's probably a, a combination of factors. I'll answer, that. I'll answer that question completely clearly for you, Scott. <laughs> and there's only two companies I have ever tasted that have done a blended grain whiskey that has been amazing, and that is the exceptional malt. Mm -hmm. So the exceptional grain whiskey and the hedonism. Those are the only two I've ever tried that have been doing justice to grain whiskeys out there. And yeah, I mean, also, I think, I mean, without trying to, you know, to our own home too much, I think, you know, we pretty much own the category with hedonism. And if you're not going to bring something out that's better than hedonism, then why would you want to do it? And you'd be really hard pressed to make something, I think, that's, that would taste better than hedonism. Uh, what about something like the uh, the cheetah distillate or Nika coffee grain being Japanese doing fully grain distillate out of Japan? Because we're seeing a very similar competition there. Nika coffee grain is delicious. Uh, I've, I've, I've been a big, big fan of, of, of that whiskey for a while. And, and yeah, it's, it's outside of Scotch whiskey. It's definitely the closest thing to a, a blended grain Scotch. Um, it's uh, There are some you know slight production differences but it's uh, no it's, it's a fantastic whiskey it really is i like that whiskey all right we'll be half on all the guests and myself scott i'd like to thank you for being on the show tonight um it's truly an honor to have you on here and everybody out there enjoy week nine of quarantine Happy Friday, everyone. And I'm not sure if you all saw this before, but I just want to make sure you're wearing I I am wearing a San Diego tuxedo with shorts on. So uh, just for you, Josh, and, and everyone down at Seven, Seven Grand, guys, I can't wait to get back down there and see you all and, and raise a glass in person with you. So until then, take care, everybody. I do like that you have your cummerbund on, and I am not wearing shoes. Thanks, everybody. I am wearing sandals, just so you know. Enjoy your evening, and have a good night. Thank you so much for watching. Cheers, guys. Cheers.